الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقولوا الناس والهجارة وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا كلكم راع وكلكم مسؤول عن رعيته صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين Respected elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Yesterday we discussed the topic of responsibility of Muslims in the UK and how when we take an oath, when we have an agreement, when we make a promise, when we have a covenant, Islam emphasizes very strongly not only by word, but Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us by deed as an example that every single promise and covenant should be fulfilled. And we mentioned at least three examples yesterday at the most difficult time of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where one would have thought that it is permissible or it is right for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to break these promises, but Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fulfilled those promises. And living in this country, we have a promise, we have an oath, we have a covenant with this country that we will abide by the law. As Muslims, along with abiding by the law and fulfilling this oath, we also mention that the first and foremost responsibility of believers is to protect their Iman, preserve their Iman and protect their Islam. The most important. And the reason why companions understood their religion is because Prophet Wasallam taught them their religion. Prophet Wasallam taught them the Iman. And Iman penetrated their hearts to such a level that they understood what is jihad and what is not jihad. They understood what is breaking an oath and what is not breaking an oath. They understood the intricacies. And that is why we find that once Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he was in the heat of the battle, he was in the heat of the battle, and he was fighting with one of the enemies who was trying to kill him. And he got on top of him. And as Ali radiallahu ta'ala was just about to kill his enemy in the heat of a legitimate Islamic battle. And this enemy of Islam, this enemy of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala spat on Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, just about to kill him, he stopped. And he moved away. And he started walking away from this enemy to go and find somebody else to fight with. This enemy of Islam took his opportunity. He got up and he was just about to hit as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, turned around and killed him. After the battle, some of the companions went to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala who had seen this and said, Oh Ali, what happened there? You are sitting on top of the enemy and you are about to kill him. And just as you are about to kill him, you moved away. And then afterwards you killed him when he was going to attack you. Were you trying to show how clever you are, how brave you are, how superhero you are? how strong you are, your fighting skills? He said, no. He said, what you did not see 
is what happened on the ground when I was just about to kill him. He said, as I was about to kill him, he spat on me. And when he spat on me, my heart changed. The condition of my heart changed. And instead of killing him for Islam, I was going to kill him because of my anger. And this is not allowed in Islam. And therefore I moved away, Allahu Akbar. Who was going to see? None of, nobody could see the condition of the heart of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anu. The enemy could not see, the Muslims could not see. Nobody could see the condition of the heart of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anu. But his iman was at such a level that he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the deception of the eyes and He knows the condition of your heart. He knows what you are hiding secretly in your hearts. And He knew that if He killed him only because of anger, then He would be accountable on the Day of Judgment. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made the iman of people before you start thinking about jihad, before you start thinking about these skewed conceptions that if I go and kill a soldier on the street of London, then I will go straight to heaven. Make your iman first. Understand iman. Hazrat Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was known as Hibbu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the most beloved companions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hibbu Rasulullah. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to love him. Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Once he went to a battle, <coughs> after returning, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he mentioned a story that happened during the battle. And he said, O oh, Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whilst we were in the heat of the battle, I cornered one of the enemy. And whilst cornering one of the enemy, I was just about to kill him. And he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. He said the kalima. But I know he said it to save himself. So I killed him. The Prophet sallallahu on hearing this, his face changed. His condition changed totally. And Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that Prophet sallallahu face became red with anger. And his face used to become red when he was really angry. And he said, you killed him even though he said, la ilaha illallah? You killed him even though he said, la ilaha illallah? You killed him? And Prophet sallallahu kept on repeating this. And I said to the Prophet, he only said it to save himself. He only said it to save himself. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, did you tear open his heart to see his intention? Allahu Akbar. Did you tear open his heart to see his intention? And as Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala says, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa became so angry that day, that I wish that I was born after that day. Today we, we see people walking on the street. And we judge them. As if we, have, we can see their hearts. That this person is like this and this person is like that. We judge them. Somebody came out of Woolwich Barracks and is walking down the street and he's got a Help the Heroes t-shirt and we judge them. That he must have killed so many Muslims in Afghanistan or he must have killed so many Muslims in Iraq. Do you know the condition of his heart? Do you know whether he even wanted to go to Iraq? Do you know whether he even went to Iraq? Do you know whether he even wanted to go to Afghanistan? Do you know whether he enjoyed going there? Do you know whether he killed anyone or he didn't kill anyone? What about your oath that you have in this country? When you are taking your child benefit, and when you are collecting your dole, and when you are securely living in your house and on the streets of London, what about your oath? At that time, you have an oath. And then when you see somebody on the street, then you think it's right for you to think about this person in a certain way and attack the person. Forget attacking the person. Our sharia, our beautiful deen, does not give permission 
for us to make judgments about a person walking on the street, even though he might be a non-Muslim. Even though he might be a non-Muslim. Our pious predecessors, when they were asked a question that who is better, this non-Muslim, who is better, this dog or yourself? The stories are found in the books of our pious predecessors. They were asked the question that who is better, the dog or yourself? And what answer they used to give? They used to say, I cannot tell you the answer now because I don't know whether I will die on Iman. If I die on Iman, then because of the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I am better than the dog. But if I do not die on Iman, if I do not die on Iman, then the dog is better than me. Who are we to make judgments? It is a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that 99.9% .9 of us who are here, if not 100%, we were born in Islam, in Iman. And that did not come because you made sajda in the belly of your, in the womb of your mother. You didn't make sajda to Allah for nine months to say, Oh Allah, make me a Muslim. Oh Allah, make me a Muslim. Oh Allah, grant me Iman. You did not sit in your mother's womb for nine months and make dua, Oh Allah, give me Iman. Oh Allah, give me Iman. And yet this Iman is so precious. This Iman is so precious that anyone who dies with Iman, the Prophet wasallam says, Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. That whoever says La ilaha illallah, they will enter into paradise. We are so fortunate that we have been granted this gift of Iman. And it is our duty whilst living in this country that we portray Iman and Islam properly. Not to give Islam a bad name. When you walk onto the street as a Muslim, or when you go to work as a Muslim, or when you interact with a non-Muslim, then they do not look at you as Muhammad Patel, or Muhammad so-and-so, or Ahmed so-and-so, or Aisha so-and-so, or Khadija so-and-so. They look at you as a Muslim. And they make judgments of you as a Muslim. Just because one Muslim killed a soldier on the street, what happened? They made judgments about Muslims. They made judgments about Muslims. This is the effect that can happen. And the reprisals that happen against Muslims just because one Muslim did a certain action. And we have to become ambassadors of Islam. True ambassadors of Islam. So that when we walk, people think that I want to become like this person. When we talk, then people think I want to become like this person. When we behave in a certain manner, they think I want to become like this person. Not I want to stay away from these kind of people. This is why we have certain duties whilst living in this country. Become ambassadors of Islam. When we came to this country, we came for a certain reason. Now we are here, we should not shy away from our Islam. Not hide away from our Islam. Those brothers who do not have beards, don't hide away just because other people don't keep beards. The Prophet ﷺ used to keep a beard. It is a sign of Islam. Today people see it as a sign of Islam and we should wear it proudly. And if you are ashamed, then Allah knows the condition of your heart. Why you are not keeping your beard. And if you are ashamed, that how can I keep this beard because so and so will say this and so and so will say that. Then just imagine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say on the day of judgment. Allah knows the condition of your heart. You can't hide that away. وَمَا تُخْفِي sudur, Allah knows, Allah, Allah knows, so He knows what is beneath the earth. The ant that is walking beneath the earth in the darkness of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where the ant is and where it is walking. Don't think we can hide. And this is a great sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ulama say it's wajib. The beard is wajib. If our iman is strong enough, then we would never be ashamed to keep a beard. It's the weakness of our iman. We need to strengthen our iman. 
strengthen our iman, strengthen our love with Allah, strengthen our love with the Prophet wasallam, so that when we arise on the day of judgment, when we arise on the day of judgment, then insha'Allah our complexion is similar to the Prophet wasallam. One Buzruk, he gives a beautiful example. He says that once I went to the haram and I left my wife and my child, small child, at the hotel. And when I went into the haram, whilst I was sitting there, there was a child that looked, my, looked very similar in complexion to my child. There were other children there as well that were playing. But this one looked very similar to my child. So I took out a sweet from my pocket and I called the child over and I gave him a sweet and I sat him down on my lap. Because I felt love for him because he looked like my child. And then he gives an example that if anybody keeps the beard only because he wants to look like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam then just imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be looking at you today. And just imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look at you on the day of judgment. Lengthen your beards. Some people keep a small beard just for the name. That I've got a beard. No. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnat awfiru al-luha wa ahfu al-shawari. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said lengthen your beards. And the most or the least you can keep is a fistful. According to one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ gave permission. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought us here on, in certain parts of the world, Muslims are living. But we are ambassadors of Islam. And Islam is the greatest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And as I said, we did not make dua. We did not make sajda. And wallahi, if all our lives we were making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only asking for iman then it would not be enough for this gift because anyone who dies with iman they will be staying forever and ever in jannat in tajri min tahtiha al-anhar khalidina fiha abada in paradise forever and ever and ever this one iman and that is why when we see individuals who are walking on the streets today in the heat of the summer half naked don't glare at them and think wow Allahu Akbar Astaghfirullah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them they do not understand the deen they do not understand the religion they do not understand what is right and what is wrong even in winter our poor women our poor women, they have to dress in this way to please people. Where the man is walking around in a shirt, in a tie, in a jacket, in an overcoat. Because it's zero degrees outside, minus two degrees. The same woman who has gone to the same function, whether it's a party or whether it's a wedding, she is coming out of the same function, half naked. Because this is how society thinks that this is freedom and this is civilization. And we must pray for them. That their thinking has been skewed by the society around them. We are so fortunate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us what is right and what is wrong. The Prophet sallallahu came to teach us what is right and what is wrong. And we are so fortunate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this iman given us this Islam and we should be taking this Islam to them we should be taking this Iman to them we should be taking these teachings to them that these are the harms of alcohol and these are the harms of gambling and these are the harms of free mixing and these are the harms of this kind of dress and these are the harms of fornication and these are the harms of adultery but instead what has happened to our Muslim community what has happened to our Muslim community? Instead of us taking the deen to them, we have changed over to become like them. May Allah save us all. It is happening within our homes, 
within every Muslim's homes. Everyone has the same problem because we have forgotten our deen, we have forgotten our religion, we have forgotten our Islam, we have forgotten our Iman. We need to remind ourselves of our Iman constantly. We need to preserve this Iman. So yes, in this country, we are here to stay. Nobody is going away. But in 10 years time, you go back 20 years ago. 20 years ago, some of our youngsters weren't even born. Go back 30 years ago. Our sisters at home listening. Our brothers are here. If our sisters who are going to work today, tomorrow, this week, wearing the dress that they wear at work, the tight type of clothing, the tights, the tight trousers, the tight clothing, t-shirts and dress. 30 years ago, in our Muslim homes, it would not have been tolerated. Any Muslim home, any Muslim home in this country today, you and I are witness that that type of clothing was not tolerated in our homes. And slowly, slowly it's entered into our homes today. That even in the religious homes, in the religious homes, our sisters are wearing tight clothing. And they are going out with tight clothing. And they are wearing the scarf to th show people we are religious people. And they have forgotten their deen and their religion. That the scarf is only one part of the hijab. The real hijab is to wear loose clothing. But it's the understanding that has become skewed and skewed and skewed. And if this is the condition 30 years later, where he, we are here today, then where will our children be 30 years from now? And where will our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren be 100 years from now? And do not think that our children and our great-grandchildren are going to go back to, uh, go to uh, India or Pakistan or Bangladesh. They're going to live in this country. And what is going to happen to their Iman? What is going to happen to their Islam? Today our children are marrying non-Muslims. Today our children are marrying Sikh, Hindu, Christian, Jewish. They are in relationships outside of marriage with Muslim and non-Muslim. If that is happening today, nearly 50% of children in this country today are born out of wed wed wedlock. News, newspaper article just last week. 50% of children, 50% of children in this country are born out of wedlock, out of marriage. It's become accepted. So Muslims have started to accept the clothing that is not allowed within Islam. Muslims have started to accept relationships that are not accepted within Islam. There is still a little bit of embarrassment where children are born out of wedlock. But do not think that our sisters and our brothers are not having relationships, intimate relationships outside of wedlock. And many of our young sisters are ending up in hospital without their parents knowing and having abortions so that they cannot they, they can show their face in public. But if the clothing was not accepted 30 years ago, and it's accepted today, my, the children outside wedlock might not be accepted today within Muslim homes, but I dread to think what might happen in 30 years time. What is going to happen to our Iman? We have to protect our Iman, we have to protect our Islam, we have to protect our progeny. And this comes through effort. It won't come just by pretending you're Muslims. Today we are Muslims, but there is Islam and there's Iman and there's Taqwa. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about some Bedouins who came and they said, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا That the Bedouins came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, We have believed, we have become mu'min. قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا 
And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, Qullam tu'minu walakin qulu aslamna. That tell them that they have not become mu'min. Because iman is in the heart, it's the condition of the heart where you love Allah and you love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the most. And every action you do is geared and is based on that foundation. So Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, tell these Bedouins that they have not become believers yet. They have become Muslim. And that's the difference. Today we are Muslim, but we are not mu'min. Muslim, we do rituals. We come for salah, we do the salah, and then we go home. And then we're back in our own ways against Allah, against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In the month of Ramadan, we fast in the month of Ramadan. But after Ramadan, we back to Muslims. Rituals. We give zakah in the month of Ramadan. Ritual. We perform hajj and we perform lots of umrahs. Because it's only about rituals. But when it comes to sacrifice, when it comes to thinking that Allah loves this, and I leave those clothes that are in my wardrobe, because they are haram, and I will buy clothes that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a sacrifice that will tell you, and that will show you the condition of your heart. What am I prepared to wear? Not only in the home, but when I go outside, who am I going to be ashamed of? Who am I going to be ashamed of? Am I going to be ashamed of the people who don't even notice my clothing? Hundreds and thousands of people will see you on the underground. Hundreds and thousands of people will see you on the bus. And they don't notice what you wear. But you are thinking, oh, people are looking at me. And that's all you are thinking. But you don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at me. Allah is looking at me. What is the condition of my heart? What is the condition of my heart? We need to change the condition of the heart so that it becomes mu'min, believers. Believers. Change our condition that we become believers, make our iman strong. And this is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to spread iman, he said, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'anzir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahhir. That, O oh, the one who is clothed with a blanket, stand up and warn the people with love and affection. Warn the people. Qum And what, how, warabbaka fakabbir, glorify your Lord. And this is one thing, how are we going to protect the iman? That's what we need to understand. How are we going to protect our Iman and Islam? For, the, for our future, for my Iman, my children's Iman, my grandchildren's Iman, and our progeny's Iman. Wallahi al-Azim, people are going away from Islam. This is the time when Prophet sallallahu said that there will come a time, there will come a time when somebody is Muslim in the morning and he is a kafir at night. One brother, he came to me in Ramadan. So just... First Ramadan, second Ramadan. He's having problems. And these problems are to do with the sins that we commit. When we do lots of sins, then Allah puts us in lots of problems. We have to stay away from sins. But whilst we were talking, he said that he works with another brother. And he said, it was two days before Ramadan actually. And he said, how are you going to fast these long fasts? And he didn't answer. And he said, you know, how are you going to fast? How are you going to fast? And then eventually he answered him. And he said, I'm not going to fast. He said, why are you not going to fast? He said, because I don't believe in Allah. This was a born Muslim. A born Muslim. And now Iman has gone, Islam has gone. No effort. Our parents need to make effort. We need to make effort. We need to preserve. Anything that is precious has to be preserved. Our Iman needs to be preserved. And then he, the same brother, he told me about another brother. He said, I grew up in Birmingham with another youngster. And he said, he became Hafiz of the Quran. Hafiz of the Quran. He used to lead us in Taraweeh. He said he also has lost his Iman now. Not only forget coming to the mosque, 
He doesn't believe in Allah. My brothers and sisters, honestly, we, we can do of source and we can remorse over these stories. But honestly, I fear what is going to happen to our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren in the future. We have to preserve Iman. The Iman has to be preserved. And there are three things. Mawlana Talha Sahib, Damat Barakatuhum, who just came, the son of Hazrat Sheikh Zakaria Rahmatullah Alayhi, he emphasized on three things. Ta'aleem, Tazkiyah and Tabliq. Ta'aleem, Tazkiyah and Tabliq. Knowledge. Make resources for knowledge. Whether it's books, whether it's madrasas, or whether it's Muslim schools, whether it's maktabs. Today, you and I, especially from the Asian subcontinent, are extremely fortunate that when our forefathers came to this country, our grandfathers, our fathers, when they came to this country, they realized, just like back home, in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, they used to go to the madrasa, they used to go to the masjid, they used to go to the maktab. The first thing that they did when they came to this country is along with opening the corner shop, along with opening the corner shop, they also opened the corner masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them greatly because that has preserved our iman, your iman and my iman. Because you in Hackney have another community from another country who are from a Muslim country. You go and see their mosques. And you go and see the level of their iman. It is because of the maktab system, it is because of the madrasas that our forefathers created in this country that you and I, our iman has been preserved. But we have to also continue the effort. The masajid, Build more masajid. Don't worry if this... Because people are getting more and more lazier. If you have to open another masjid, open it. If you have to open another maktab, as long as ta'aleem is, is zinda, is alive and kicking, inshallah our children will learn and it will preserve their iman. Keep teaching them the Qur'an. Keep teaching them the hadith. Keep teaching them the Islam. Put iman into their hearts. Put the love of Islam into their hearts. Give them the stories of the, of the Prophet ﷺ. Give them the stories of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and our pious predecessors. Preserve our masajid, preserve our makatib, our madaris. Every institution that is working for the sake of deen, support it wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Because this will preserve the iman of the future generations. Let it not be the condition... Muslim schools are important, madrasas are important, all of these institutions are important, support every single one. There's a school which is being opened soon by Tawheed islam support it. Ask about it, send your children to it. If you want the iman of your children to be preserved, and remember, dunya, this world, you can achieve. People who are poor, they also live in this world. But people who don't have Iman, they will never ever go to Jannah. Iman is the most important. Have fikr of your Iman and your children's Iman. And let it not be. Hazrat Shaykh Mufti Taqi Sahib Damat Barakatuh, he once said, he was visiting Cordoba. He was visiting Cordoba, where we used to have mad madrasas, maktabs, masajid, thriving Islamic community for 800 years in Spain. And when you visit Cordoba, you will see that there is a masjid, beautiful masjid, that has now become a church. And when you go inside, they follow you to make sure that you do not even pray two rakats in there. So somebody accompanied Hazrat Shaykh Mufti Taqi Sahib Damat Barakatuhum. And they asked the question that, O oh, Mufti Sahib, do you envisage a time when this church will again become a masjid. And what an amazing answer Mufti Sab gave. He said that today is a time when we should be thinking that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our masajid that we have in masajid. Preserve our masajid as masajid and they don't turn into churches. 
You look today in UK, magnificent churches, magnificent buildings. Go and see Azhar Academy. It was a church before. Beautiful building, one of the beautiful, most beautiful buildings in Newham. But what is it now? They are selling it to Muslims. But if we don't preserve the iman of our progeny, and we don't preserve the iman of our future generation, in a hundred years time, think about what will happen in a hundred years time. If our children don't have the strength of iman, then let it not be that they might sell the masajids to other people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve our institutions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve our iman. So ta'aleem, revive ta'aleem in your homes. Open the fazail a'mal and every single day at least read a story. At least read a little bit of any Islamic book which has stories which inspire us and which bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which bring us closer to Allah. Ta'aleem, revive ta'aleem in the masajid, in the makatib, in the madaris. Send your children to learn. Don't say, keep them behind. And even at the age of 13 and 14, send them somewhere to learn. Ta'aleem. Ta'aleem is very important. Ta'aleem of our deen. And today, it's not as if you have to go and buy a book. You have your iPads, you have your Kindles, you have your phones that have books. One story a day in the home, it's not difficult. It just takes out some time. Create an environment. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Glorify your Lord. Who doesn't know Coca-Cola today? Who doesn't know McDonald's today? Who does not know Adidas and Nike today? Every single child, two years old, three years old, when you buy him some trainers with two stripes and you bring it to him, and say, I have brought you Adidas. He said, Dad, who are you fooling? Even a two-year-old child knows what is Adidas. But our two-year-old child, five-year-old child, ten-year-old child, fifteen-year-old child doesn't know who the Prophet Muhammad is. Why? Because McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Adidas, Nike have a marketing tool, marketing exercise, marketing management, Marketing drive that puts that name into your brain and it never leaves your brain and never leaves your hearts. Today we should make sure that we put the name of Allah into the hearts of our youngsters that it never leaves their hearts. Allah, Allah, Allah. Who is Allah? Tell them who is Allah. Who is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Tell them who is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa rabbaka fakabbir. And when you talk about Allah, and when you talk about the magnificence of Allah, and when you talk about the, the might of Allah, then when something happens, then they will say, it only happened because of the will of Allah. They will not start to question. They will not start to question. Talk about Allah. Let's market, marketing exercise in your homes. At the moment your marketing is done by the television. Your marketing in your homes is done by the laptop, is done by the iPad, is done by the phone, the iPhones, and the galaxies. That is the marketing tool for our children. They are learning everything from that. We need to change the marketing in our homes. And we put the marketing of Allah and the Prophet and the companions of the Prophet into our homes. Ta'leem, number one. Number two, Taskiyah. Cleansing of our hearts, purifying our hearts. This was one of the objectives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنْفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُو عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ That purify the hearts. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam purified the hearts of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who were worse than animals before iman. They used to fight over small things, petty things, but Prophet sallallahu purified their hearts. So much so that I mentioned the story, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala could not kill that person because he knew the condition of his heart. Their hearts were changed, totally. Totally. Before, how did they used to look at people? They used to look at black slaves as the worst of people. But when Iman came, and when the purification of the heart came, and the Prophet ﷺ conquered Makkah. 
Fath Makkah, in the eighth year of Hijrah, and it was the time for Zuhr. The first person in Islam to go on top of the Kaaba and to pronounce the Azan, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Bilal, go and climb on top of the Kaaba and pronounce Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the companions, they looked at it with pride. They didn't look at Bilal as a black Abyssinian slave. They looked at Bilal as somebody who when he accepted Islam at the beginning of Islam and he was put in the heat of the Arabian desert and a stone was put on his chest and he, he was told, turn away from this deen, turn away from this religion and he kept on saying, Ahad, Ahad, there is only one Lord, there is only one Lord and because of this sacrifice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated his status to such that he put him on top of the Kaaba and he was the first to pronounce Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Purify your hearts. Purify your hearts. Take out all these illnesses. Jealousy is in our hearts. Hasad is in our hearts. Hatred is in our hearts. We pretend there is no sincerity in our hearts. We smile in front of people and then when we turn away, we swear behind under, under our breaths. This is a condition of the heart that needs to be changed. And how do you change the condition? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. All you who believe, be God conscious, become God conscious. And how? Stay with the pious people, stay with the sadiqeen. Connect yourself with a shaykh, with somebody who is very pious, very, very pious, so that they can help you rectify your heart. Buzluks, who we know are good at rectifying our hearts. Hazrat Mawlana Shavali Tani Rahmatullah over 70, 80 years ago he used to say that at that time he used to say that in this day and age everyone has to connect themselves with the Shaykh to purify their hearts. So just imagine this day and age. Mufti Rafi Sahib at one place he says that my brother, he used to live in Lahore. One of his brothers who passed away, his elder brother. And he was fortunate to stay in the company of Hazrat Mawlana Shafi'i Tani Rahmatullah. So Hazrat Mufti Shafi Sahib wrote to him and he said, connect yourself with some pious person in Lahore. That's how important he used to think. So he wrote back saying, I have stayed with the likes of Mawlana Shafi'i Tani Rahmatullah and there is no one like that here. So who am I going to find? And listen to the answer of Hazrat Mufti Shafi Sahib Rahmatullah. Mufti Shafi Sahib wrote back and he said, do you think that you are the most pious person in Lahore? That your heart is so pure. And then he said, go and sit with the muazzin of the masjid. Go and sit with the muazzin of the masjid. Why? Because the muazzin of the masjid, he at least prays his namaz, takbir e ula five times a day. By sitting with him, inshallah, you, the condition of your heart will get better. So ta'aleem and tazkiyah. Have, con- have some fikr about the condition of our hearts. We have to purify our hearts. Today, the condition, why we don't change externally? Because the condition of our heart hasn't changed. And then, tabliq. <coughs> Connect yourself with tabliq. Whether it's individual tabliq or whether it's with the tabliq jamaat. But we have to spread the message of Islam. This is warabbaka fakabbir. If you talk to people about Islam, then this is, you are marketing Islam. And this is all part of deen. The cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Qutham bin Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. I'm, I'm just giving you an example of tabliq. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam majority are buried outside Medina Munawwara. Because they took the deen out. They took the deen out to people. Qutham bin Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is buried in Samarqand, in the Balkan states. It shows where the companions went to. And today, one of the ways to protect and preserve our deen is tabliq jamaat. Sometimes you think that, where can I send my young child, 14, 15 years old, the environment is so bad, let me send him to tabliq, at least he will be preserved for three days. Hazrat Malana Ilyas started this fikr and this worry that how can we change the condition of the people? And Allahu Akbar, his sincerity was such, his sincerity was such that today you look at 
the acceptance of the jamaat and the tabligh and where it has got to. What level? But even then, he was never proud that look what I have achieved because the condition of his heart was beautiful. Once as a Mufti Shafi sahab, rahmatullahi alayhi, he visited Malana Ilyas sahab, rahmatullahi alayhi. And Malana Ilyas sahab was sitting on his bed and he was his old age. And Tabligh Jamaat had spread far and wide. And Malana Mufti Shafi sahab sat with him and he started crying. Malana Ilyas sahab started crying. And he cried profusely. Afterwards, he mentioned to his son why he was crying. Mufti Shafi sahab mentioned to Mufti Rafi sahab, he said, that the reason why he was crying, he said to me, that maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spread tabligh jamaat so much, because it's istidraj. And istidraj meant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making me happy in this world, so that I feel good. And then when I go in the hereafter, then Allah will punish me. That's how he used to think. Sometimes when he used to read the newspapers, he, and he used to hear a bad story, he used to start crying and he used to think, Oh Allah, because of my sins this has happened. Because of my sins this has happened. Hazrat Mawlana Siddiq Banwi Rahmatullah alayhi, he was also, so much fikr he had, that he used to go village to village, village to village, no car, no uh, truck, bicycle, walking. Sometimes he used to sleep on the hay, or on the grass, and then go to the next village just to preserve the iman of people. We have to do some fikr. We have to have some kind of fikr. Every single person here and who's listening should be engaged in some form of tabligh. Some form of tabligh. Whether it's with tabligh jama'a or whether it's any other form of tabligh. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you on the day of judgment that in 24 hours you used to work 8 hours or 10 hours for you and your family. How much time? And you used to perform the faraiz, You used to perform your namaz and you used to perform the rituals. But how much time did you give to preserve the deen? In any which way? 15 minutes of your day to preserve the deen of Islam, to preserve the progeny of Islam? Either through a good word, either through a message through internet, either through a message through the phone, or either supporting the tabligh jamaat. Whichever way, 15 minutes we should be giving at least every single day to preserve the Iman of our progeny and to preserve the Iman of our future generations. Latch on to some work of deen. Give some time so that it will rectify us, it will give us some fikr, it will give us some worry about the deen and we will be helping to support some function and some part of the deen for future generations. Iman is the most important. Iman is the most important. My brothers and sisters, do not let go of our Iman. And let's start thinking and worrying about the Iman of our youngsters. We know where they are heading today. We know how much love they have for Iman and Islam and we know how much they love they have for this dunya. We need to change that condition. Because if this is the condition of their condition today, what will be the condition in a hundred years time? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to worry about our Iman. Help us to worry about the Iman of our progeny, about everybody who is living in this world today and everybody who is going to live in the future. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them the Iman in their hearts and grant them the ability to die on Iman. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the Iman of every one of us and our families and of our future generations. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa nashiru wa la ilaha illa anta wa nastaghfiru wa